Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. We're broadcasting live from Park City, Utah, where I am, where I am often these days. I'm so glad to be here. It's a little cold today. We had snow uh, a couple of days ago. Um, and Shelly, you're in California, and we have people all over the place, so I'm not going to get into that. But we've got uh, several guests with us today, and we're super happy um, uh, to have everybody with us. We uh, can't hear or see you. We know you're there. Uh, we're going to open things up for questions throughout. So as they come to mind, please feel free to post them in the Q&A of the chat box, and we'll get to as many as possible. We have a lot of people joining today. Our uh, objective of today is to talk about um, three companies that are customers of uh, Mercury and Mercury itself. Uh, so we're going to highlight what each company does, and then they're going to talk a little bit about uh, their affiliation with Mercury. Uh, many of you may not know what Mercury is, and so full disclosure, Shelly and I have been friends for a long time. She's uh, with uh, uh, business relations with Mercury, and I think I'm, I'm going to get this all wrong so you can cut it out with the compliance, but uh, Mercury is not a bank. It's what I think is called a neobank. It's it's basically a super cool overlay on two chartered banks that makes it really easy for venture capitalists, investors, entrepreneurs to operate the banking part that's just necessary. It makes it just incredibly easier. And I'm I'm giving you a, a sales pitch because I'm using it. Um, and so uh, I've, I've tasted the medicine and it's uh, the the interface is just uh, unbelievable compared to working with any other bank. So um, again, it's not a bank, but it's a, a, a service provider overlaying two banks. So I probably screwed all that up, but um, you know, we've actually really enjoyed using it. Uh, so again, please feel free to post your questions to the Q and A in the chat box. We're going to make sure everybody gets in touch with everybody. Uh, um, at the conclusion of today's webinar, we have about an hour. We're going to, uh, uh, Shelly and Puya are going to talk a little bit about Mercury to start just really briefly. And then we're going to talk to each company individually and talk about what they do, where they're at, what their ask is, if there's anything. And uh, again, please feel free to ask any question that you uh, are compelled to ask. And, and please post it when it comes to mind so we can get to as many as possible. So with that, Shelly, so good to see you. We were sitting at the Soho House a month and a half ago in Brooklyn, um, and uh, I'm so glad to see you here virtually, and uh, it's it's always uh, a welcome thing to chat with you. So please tell us a little bit about Mercury. Thanks, Arthur. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Shelly. Uh, I'm a Director of Relationship Management at Mercury. Uh, Arthur, you actually did a really good job on the compliance front. Uh, I think some of our, our marketers can also take a page out of your ability to uh, jot out the compliance approved language. Uh, Mercury is uh, not a bank or a fintech. Uh, we have two chartered banks that we overlay uh, on top of and create products and user experiences that are really designed for uh, startups and companies of this decade. Uh, and so my role is working with high growth startups. Uh, one of the companies in my portfolio is presenting here today. That's Air Garage. Hey, Jonathan. Hey, David. Uh, and so I'm working with founders who uh, are raising or have raised uh, at least between five to $10 million. And we often see them through uh, to their Series B raises and beyond. Um, and I'd like to share, uh, to give the, the mic to my colleague Puya for a second and have him share his work as well. Hello, everyone. We are a director of relationship management focused on our VC banking experience. I came over to Mercury about six months ago. I've been tasked with building out an offering for emerging managers, you know, uh, within the ecosystem and getting onto our platform, but also bringing the value added services such as introductions to LPs and family offices such as yourself. So it's been very exciting times for us this year. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, if it's okay with everybody, we're going to start out with. Uh, Millie, Millie, if you could just give us a, a little background on you, the company, and uh, what's important to you, that would be awesome. 
Yeah, sounds good. Thank you, Arthur, and thank you, Shelley, for inviting us. Um, I know there will be a second session for Deeper Dive, so I'll keep it today uh, a little bit more casual. Um, my name is Millie Liu, uh, founder and managing partner of First Star Ventures. We're based in Boston. We're early stage, pre-seed, and C-stage venture fund that invests in um, cutting-edge deep tech. Um, as a fund, we're vertical agnostic, but we're actually very, we have a very specific lens through data and computing and AI, how it boosts efficiency and disrupt almost every single industry. So in that sense, we're actually a specialist. 100% of the founders that we back are technical. Many of them are researchers, professors, PhDs, and uh, also a lot of them are industry veterans, uh, engineers, or serial entrepreneurs. So um, just to give you some examples of the kind of things that we invest in, um, some of our latest investments include spin out out of MIT, Harvard, NASA, and they're all applying computational approaches. Um, for example, uh, one of our company is like uh, using computational approach to design completely novel protein in a synthetic biology world for food and industrial applications. And then another using machine learning and CRISPR engineering for uh, biopesticides. Um, another one they're using quantum inspired uh, algorithms uh, with computational approach for novel high performance alloy designs. Um, and we also have a bunch of portfolio companies in the climate space, such as um, mid and long range weather prediction. Again, these are all very high dimensional computational problems. Uh, we also have three portfolio companies in geothermal and mining. And turns out these are also like super data intensive industries. So about two thirds of our portfolio companies in computational biology, chemistry, climate, such as ocean science, geology, um, and we see opportunities going forward in these fields for at least another five to 10 years. Uh, and we also invest in uh, up and down the tech stack where again, data and computing and AI gives a huge technical edge. Um, so while our um, companies, they all have a pretty deep technical barrier, but as a fund, we actually have a very heavy emphasis on capital efficiency. So for us, we think a lot about our company's time to market and also um, the capital efficiency. Um, so we, while we invest in deep tech is a very broad umbrella, we actually don't invest in the things that will take hundreds of million dollars and it's very binary if it work or not in 10 years uh, as a lot of those like billionaire side projects. Uh, for us, we really think hard on um, if this is something that can be uh, go to market within two years or if the technology platform can be validated in a year or two. In a sense, as a fund, we take engineering risk instead of the very binary scientific risk. Um, and again, like this is where data, computing, AI, uh, they have hugely accelerated this efficiency, uh, both in terms of the capital and in terms of time. So for example, a lot of the problems in like structural biology, structural chemistry, that used to be scientific problem, but now they're actually all engineering problems. Um, so before starting First Star, my personal background, I was actually uh, trained as a mathematician uh, from my academic training, and I was a serial entrepreneur uh, before starting First Star. Uh, I was very lucky to be at MIT when I was in graduate school, uh, when it was at the very early stage, when computing power is just enough for machine learning or deep learning to realize its value. Um, I started my first AI company in medical image diagnosis using computer vision and unsupervised machine learning about 10 years ago. Um, the company is doing operation now, uh, ran by my co-founder who I give my CEO title to. Um, we've raised over 200 million and our product is in over 20 countries now and have helped tens of millions of patients and physicians. And before that, I was part of a data analytics startup uh, that got acquired by MasterCard for over 600 million, uh, where I was uh, in charge of our some of our largest clients, including uh, Walmart, Procter Gamble, and personally, I'm on the board of uh, MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, which is the first AI lab in the world and uh, the largest lab at MIT with over a thousand members. Um, and my I am doing this with my co-GP Drew. Um, Drew is a computer scientist trained at Harvard, also a 
your entrepreneur uh, who has been a co-founder, CTO, VP of engineering. Um, we actually met about 10 years ago uh, after his second exit, when he became an angel investor and mentor looking to give back to the community. And he became my technical advisor to my startup. And then after his third exit, uh, which he was on the early team um, as on a company called Semantic Machine, uh, he was the founding VP of engineering there. Um, so that company was the best new uh, natural language understanding team in the world, which Microsoft uh, acquired them for over 300 million for 18 months of work. Uh, the product has always been stealth uh, before it got acquired. So after his uh, uh, third exit, then together we started first our ventures. Um, so while we're both transitioning out of our last, uh, last startups, we both believe in this huge potential to be further unlocked by data and computing. So we experimented a thesis with a few million dollars out of a family office, and then we institutionalized the fund to be first our ventures in 2017. Um, and especially in this field, uh, it actually does require the investors to have a very deep technical understanding, um, especially at early stage, because most of the companies that we invest in, when we invest, there's uh, no revenue. A lot of the time, uh, they don't even have products. So um, as a team, having been uh, coming from technical background, having been surrounded entrepreneurs, having built companies in the field, um, our edge is really where we speak the te technical language uh, as the founders. Uh, we actually were very nerdy. We read a lot of academic research papers, uh, and we even just look at codes um, from the founders. Um, so now we're investing out of our second institutionalized fund. Um, our last fund, uh, we made 27 investments, which we wrapped up last year, and we started making new investments out of the new fund uh, this year. Uh, this new fund, we're targeting $40 million, which uh, we've already raised about half of it and uh, still have the second half to close. Uh, we deploy the first fund properly for five years, and uh, we mostly focus on the East Coast in North America, in the U.S. and Canada, where uh, around ecosystems with very, very strong, uh, deep technical talents. Uh, we have also been very disciplined. Uh, typically, our average entry point for pre-seed is about 5 million post-money valuation, and for seed is about 10 million post-money valuation, which um, it really pays off in this market. Um, we haven't had any write-offs or markdowns so far. And then for our last fund, a third of our last fund's LP commitments were already realized through exits, either uh, distributed or recycled. Um, we started our relationship with Mercury uh, about half a year ago. Uh, it was uh, right, actually, we started engaging right before um, the SVB event. And then uh, Mercury was actually... I'll say a lifesaver that uh, they got us up and running just one day after the SVB uh, incident. Um, the user experience is has been like super slick. Uh, the technology um, as a banking service, you know, it's uh, really easy to use. Um, and it's super easy for us to do our corporate cars, payrolls, expenses, paying vendors. Um, now we have two funds, so we have five different entities. So transferring money between different entities um, is like super easy front end. And uh, yeah, whenever there's anything, um, the Mercury team has been extremely responsive. So thank you, Mercury, for just great existence. Um, yeah, and I think Shelly and uh, Arthur will probably share our contact information. So feel free to reach out if you want to chat more about our fund or uh, for any direct interest into our portfolio companies. So you answered every question. The only one you didn't answer is, you know, what what haven't you accomplished? I mean, we're, uh, I feel a little lame here, but uh, you're really nicely done. Thank you, Millie, so much for that. And so the the half of the current fund round is available. So you're open to LPs um, presently. Yes, uh, we'll probably keep it open for another half a year. Um, so please do reach out. Yeah, and deal flow wise, are you inundated, or or you do you have an appetite for deal flow? 
Um, so we are uh, we are actively deploying right now, and uh, we definitely see a lot of opportunities. Uh, we made two investments so far this year, and typically we make about four to six investments every year. Um, so this is a fund that we just started this year, um, but we we do um, expect to be very actively deploying. Great, thank you so much, Millie. That mm -hmm. was awesome. Uh, Sunam Suman, sorry, you would you like to be next? Sure, sounds good. Thanks, Arthur. Let me share my screen. Perfect. And uh, I have till about 11.45. Yep. Perfect. Let me just on the slideshow. Hi, everyone. Uh, so while it loads up, let me just uh, start. So Shuman Talukdar, I'm the uh, founder and uh, solo GP of a micro VC fund called AI Sprouts. I'm um, currently working on uh, closing out my second vehicle. Target is uh, beginning of uh, next year. Um, thank you so much for, for having me here. So raising capital, I have an active portfolio of about uh, 30 or so companies that um, definitely are open to any kind of business development relationships as well. So if any family offices or high net worth individuals have complimentary companies, always great to chat with you. Uh, my relationship with Mercury has actually started. I'm part of uh, uh, this program called Cool Water for high potential uh, emerging managers. Mercury is a great supporter of Wintermead and Cool Water. We connected through that, and I'm now plugged into this uh, awesome ecosystem that uh, that they support. Um, so, so thank you, Mercury, for for having me, Shelly and Puya, for having me here uh, with with Arthur. Um, just briefly, uh, when I want, want to make sure everyone has a clear understanding of who we are, kind of what we focus on, uh, you know, what makes us different, our edge, and then, you know, open door policy to having follow up conversations. So um, AI Sprouts uh, is invest in post traction AI. So these are ventures that are uh, what we call advancing human potential. Um, think about basically a, a new digital fabric that's being created uh, by AI. These are the companies that are going to be the new operating system for humanity. And uh, that's what we invest in. So typically our investments are seed stage, um, mostly Silicon Valley focus and a, a strong, strong uh, sort of interest in co-investing with the best funds around. And uh, the models worked. Um, we're backed by uh, former founders and VCs from firms that include, uh, you know, Kleiner Perkins, NEA, um, Siri, and uh, highlights on the first uh, fund, similar portfolio construction, about 27 investments. Um, the standouts have raised uh, over 150 million of follow-on capital that's since 2020, and uh, have realized about five to 22 X in markups, valuation markups through their series B. Um, as I mentioned, working on my fund to close, just really briefly, um, as uh, Millie mentioned, we're gonna we're gonna have a follow up discussion so I can get into this stuff in in more depth. But my track record, I'm a Silicon Valley investor and operator. Uh, background, you know, seven billion in exits, uh, two IPOs, uh, five of them were back to back, and then um, now with the first fund, 150 million follow on raised, and um, and so I successfully built this track record specifically around AI. One of my uh, uh, first tutors was uh, went on to be one of the founders of Siri. Um, I bring this network that comes from my unicorn experiences to the fund. These includes companies like Cloudflare, um, Anaplan, two IPOs, and then Clearwell, uh, all in the enterprise software infrastructure stack. And then rounding out my background, private equity experience from firms like Parthenon, Bessemer, um, and a great network that includes firm uh, uh, institutions like Harvard and Rice that I help pull uh, into my portfolio companies and investments. So what's what's the edge for, for our organization? It's basically this network. Um, it's giving portfolio companies and LPs that are part of this community access to the best of the best. Uh, so that includes, you know, Adam, he's a, he was the founder of Siri, uh, founder of Viv, sold to Apple and then Samsung. Uh, Forrest Basket, Midas List, uh, he's a, a partner at NEA. Um, Michelle, great uh, board uh, level experience. Uh, she also runs our own venture fund and Foley is our, is our council. And uh, this uh, community is, uh, you know, basically we're compounding on that from through the second vehicle. 
So AI Sprouts Fund One has brought us great founders, great executives, and it's SLPs, co-investment with other funds, which I'll get into in a little bit more depth. And then obviously sourcing from some of the best academic institutions around. Uh, but let me let me talk a little bit about what the what the focus is. So as, as many one as everyone is talking about today, uh, when we kind of recognize in, in 2019, we've hit this tipping tipping point moment uh, for this automation opportunity. And you know algorithms that have been available for a long time, data is now you know cheaper, easier to store. But it's really the computational horsepower. Uh, you're looking at about trillion times that's come to the table over you know 20 year period, million times in the last decade, million times in the next decade. That's what's created this moment today, which is uh, this paradigm shift where AI is no longer a science fair project. We do not invest in science fair projects. We invest in post traction companies. So this is what we call practical AI. Is here, um, you know, Chat GPT, GPT type sort of a paradigm where you can fine tune models. That's just the beginning. So our focus is take this massive AI opportunity and identify the companies with the most breakout potential, uh, bringing the, the experience we've seen from our uh, past um, work and uh, find the, the, the massive opportunities. So we have this tried and tested recipe of focusing on traction, so that basically includes, you know, founders with a mission. That's where the 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 founders belief belief system comes in into a, into an idea. Uh, obviously, traction. So that's early revenues, great usage, or pilots. So real demonstrated proof that a product is delighting a customer, and then uh, some clear understanding of a competitive advantage to win the market. And uh, and based on the fund size, um, so we're targeting. Uh, for the second vehicle, where we have check sizes that are complementary to the lead, um, so that allows us to, you know, work with the best co-investors around and get into amazing rounds that a lot of uh, family offices and high net worth um, individuals would, wouldn't generally see, and um, and that that comes from our life's work network. So some of the value add, just to briefly walk through this. Obviously, you know, post investment or even pre investment, getting to know the founders through capital introductions. Uh, so there's a there's a huge ecosystem of funds today, and we win by by being agnostic, helping founders connect with the best funds that make sense for their investment, and in that way, actually, um, sort of getting get our foot in the door early into opportunities. Uh, go to market support from this massive industry network of uh, obviously multiple unicorns. Think about the human capital that's there, uh, whether it's a former CRO, former you know director of marketing, VP of engineering that's built products before. We give access to that to the founders. Um, having seen the movie play out from previous companies, so obviously personally as an operator, uh, you know five back to back exits. I've kind of seen what works, what doesn't work. Being able to give founders insights in terms of what are, what are the best steps to take, and then uh, this community that includes the LPs. Uh, so with this new vehicle, we probably have room for about ten to fifteen new LPs, and what we really want is LPs that are going to be interested in uh, being helpful to our portfolio companies, and that compounds uh, into our advantage. So we do things to support this, including a founder boot camp. Uh, CEO summit, quarterly meetups, um, you know, dinners, and that actually facilitates a, a really thriving and active community. So a couple of slides and I'll wrap up this intro. Um, you know, coming into the second vehicle, uh, great testimonials for founders. They love to work with us. Um, some of the highlights here is being able to anticipate what's going to what's coming around the corner, uh, whether it's fundraising, whether it's key customer milestones, milestones, obviously introductions to this network and uh, and then just perspectives on on how these hyper uh, scale growth companies come out and um, and yeah and, and, the, and the model works so uh, fund one is crushing it uh, these are some of the highlights so uh, majority of the investments have been enterprise software um, one of them is in the auto uh, pro uh, productivity automation space zero systems uh, smart cities climate tech some ro some robotics uh, intelligent manufacturing, uh, so about 150 million follow-on capital. Uh, just some of the highlights as you get to get a sense of what these companies look like when they work. You're looking at um, you know boost up intelligence. This is all since 2020 has raised uh, 40 million in capital through the Series B. 
That was a 20X uh, multiple since our seed investment. Hayden just closed the 50 million Series B round. Uh, they're a uh, uh, 22X multiple. Uh, this is out of a portfolio of 27 companies. Uh, Zero Systems, it's in the Series A stage. They're, they're raising a B, um, 3X so far. And, uh, and, and that's our model. So uh, through the fund one, uh, you know, the portfolio spans a combination of what I call AI, SaaS, and deep tech. Uh, so again, it's a lens focused on finding the companies with traction. And so you get a portfolio of, you know, enterprise software, computer vision, um, you know, uh, cross section of other themes, but the core core piece is all AI, machine learning, deep learning that's being applied. I'll get into all of this stuff at, as a follow up. Um, but to wrap up, you know, invest, we invest with a co, uh, co invest with the best funds in the business. Some of them include boutique funds here, uh, like accomplice emerging all enterprise focus and then specialist firms as well, uh, it, that might be focused on transportation, climate tech, and as an AI investor, we're, we're hitting a cross section of everything. So, um, uh, just wrapping up, um, uh, it's fund two doubling my initial check size from the first fund. So I'm not changing anything. I'm just doubling down on a strategy that's worked, uh, targeting to make about 25 investments. Um, the initial check size will be probably 100 to 250K. And then as the companies really show promise that they're really working, scaling to be, you know, potentially massive businesses, we'll double, we'll, we'll go into as much as 10% of the fund. So call it about a million dollars per company based on the amount of capital that we've soft circle to date. Um, and, uh, with, uh, you know, uh, the amazing outcome driving the returns. So, yeah, so these are all the details, uh, targeting a Q1 number of about 10 million to close it out, um, have raised uh, 5 million so far, uh, that would bring total AUM across funds around 20 million and, uh, standard structure two and 20, uh, family offices get access to co-investment opportunities, uh, S through SPVs. And, um, and yeah, if you're interested to learn more, um, you know, here's a, a link, you can actually go to it. And if you just want to wire right now, you can do that. Otherwise you can send me an email, um, Schumann at AI Sprouse VC. And, uh, thank you for your time. Yeah. Super helpful. So the first fund was just under 10 and the second one's going to be 10. So a total of two, 20, 20, uh, 20 yeah. across the two funds. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and the co-investment opportunity is uh, uh, commensurate with how much you put into the fund. Yeah, I, I, you know, to date, it's uh, you know, with um, with my LP base, uh, yeah, usually people get the allocation that they want, but yeah, there it's assumed that um, that uh, you get pro rata based on your contribution to the fund. Yeah, very cool, super helpful. Thank you, and. And can we talk just a moment about Mercury and your interaction with them? Yeah, no, it's been great. I, I appreciate connecting with Puya and Shelly. Uh, so as I mentioned, they're, they're a supporter of this program called Cool Water. And um, so they have a batch of emerging managers every uh, six months that they bring on. And so we connected through that. We had a, a demo day with LPs and they've been super helpful uh, welcoming me to the now to the Mercury community. And, uh, and yeah, so we're in the beginning of that, that journey with them. Cool. I hadn't heard about cool water. Thanks for sharing that with me. Yeah, no problem. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Jonathan, welcome. Take it away. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Let me get my screen shared here. Why do you look so familiar? That's a good question. Have we met before? I don't know. Jeez, you look so familiar. Could be from a past life, you know? I have lots of those. Yeah, you never know how far it goes back. You guys can see my screen, right? Yes, see screen? Yes. Okay, cool, yes, thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right, just want to make sure I'm not talking into the abyss. All right, um, so yeah, thanks for having me. My name is Jonathan Barkle. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Air Garage. Uh, so slightly different angle than we were talking about with the last two groups. Uh, we are not a fund. We are an operating company. Uh, and what we do is manage and monetize parking lots and parking garages. So if you own real estate, you're probably familiar with parking because parking is usually sort of the neglected stepchild of the real estate industry. And if you have owned real estate, you inherently usually wind up owning some parking with it. So, you know, at a high level, what Air Garage is and what we do is we consider ourselves a full service parking operator, right? 
Um, you know, and what that means is that we basically do everything involved in taking a piece of asphalt with stripes on it uh, and turning it into a full-fledged parking operation that generates revenue and income for the owner, right? So we do everything for you. We do the advertising, the payment collection, the enforcement, mobilizing vehicles, towing vehicles, picking up trash, everything that you would expect from a parking company or a real estate property management company. Uh, we just try to do it using the technology that you would expect in 2023 instead of kind of what you're used to seeing in 1980, right? So, you know, a, a brief history of, of why we started Air Garage and kind of why the parking industry is the way that it is today is if any of you, which I'm sure all of you have, have driven or parked a car in the United States in the last several years, you probably have noticed that it's not meaningfully different from parking a car was 20 years ago. Uh, and so it's kind of a question of like, well, why is it that way? Um, you know, technology and the internet has changed pretty much everything else around us, but parking for some reason is still very much stuck in this analog old school way of doing things. And, you know, the reason for that is that there's these traditional management companies, you know, there's kind of this layer cake in the parking industry. You have at the bottom, the asset owners, the real estate owners, they're hiring a property management company, a parking operator, which is, you know, one of these traditional companies that have been around for 50 or hundred years. They've been doing things the same way for 50 or hundred years. And they just install machines and gate arms and cash and attendance, all that sort of basic stuff to run a property, right? Uh, and, you know, in the last 20 years, there's been lots of software entrepreneurs that have come to the industry and said, well, this is a really crappy experience, but I know how to write code so we can fix it. And the way that they go about doing that is by building an app to collect payments from drivers, because you probably have seen these apps. There's a million of them out there. You've had to download a new one every time you park in a different parking garage. And they sell those apps to the old school management companies because they don't want to have to do the legwork of actually being in the operations business because that's not fun. That's not software, right? And what we've seen is that this hasn't fundamentally changed the industry. And so our whole thesis is you can't change the parking industry and change the way that real estate is done by just selling technology to these old school companies. You have to build that technology yourself and then you have to use it to go out, compete them at their own game. And so that's what Air Garage is doing. And that's why we're this full service parking operator is we bring both the technology and the operations under the same roof and try to make the best returns and best optimizations for each real estate owner's property while we're at it. Um, and you know the results sort of speak for themselves. So today, Air Garage manages about 225 parking lots and parking garages across 37 states in the United States, plus some in Canada. Uh, and you know we've seen average net operating income increases in the range of about 23%. Uh, and it can vary a lot. Like we've seen properties where the NOI increases 300%. We've seen properties where it's more like 10%. But the point is that there's a lot of waste in the parking industry. There's not a lot of data and insights into how things are operating. And oftentimes owners just aren't really thinking about their parking like they're thinking about the rest of their business. They're thinking of it as sort of a sideshow. They're not really seeing it as what it is, which is that it's a business that can generate income. And it's the first experience that a lot of drivers have when they come visit your properties, right? And so it's part of this holistic picture. And so partnering with owners, we've been able to increase their NOI significantly. And I'm going to kind of briefly talk through here, just operationally, like how we do some of these things. So um, there's a lot of things that go into increasing owner's NOI, uh, but one of the biggest ones is real-time dynamic pricing, which we'll talk about that nobody else in the industry does. Marketing, you know, creating a better driver experience, and also just creating a better deal structure because so many real estate owners that we come across don't even know how much their parking lot actually makes. Uh, and they're kind of just in this asymmetry war of information with the parking operator because the parking operator doesn't want them to know how much it makes because the parking operator is getting a screaming deal on it. And so they want the owner to think, oh, it's not making any money. You know, we're barely breaking even here. And the owner isn't an expert in parking and doesn't want to be and has other things going on. And so we're just trying to be transparent about those things and structure better deals for people. And all of those things combined lead to more income for the owner. Uh, but one thing I want to mention before I dive into some of the just features here is that like local operations and physical property management is very difficult. And it's still like a critical base layer that anybody has to expect from a parking management company, right? Uh, you know, we have to and want to automate the things that can and should be automated, but we cannot and should not try to automate the things that cannot or should not be automated, like picking up the trash and making sure that the property is taken care of, doing enforcement, all these basic things. So these are the basic things that local operations is what you should expect from any parking management company. And then we're basically saying, okay, now, if you just want the local operations, you should go with sort of a traditional operator. But if you want that and all of this stuff that's on top of it that I'm about to talk about, that's where Air Garage can be a better partner for you. Um, so one of the biggest things that drives revenue increases for property owners that we work with is dynamic pricing. You know, dynamic pricing is a pretty common thing in pretty much every industry these days. If you're buying an airline seat, they're changing the price based on which seat you're buying on the plane. They're changing the price based on the day of the week, the season, the route that you're taking, all these sorts of things. 
Same thing for hotel rooms, same thing for pretty much everything else, even down to restaurant seats these days, right? Uh, but dynamic pricing doesn't exist in the parking industry, really. And uh, it's, it's partially a mindset issue with the parking industry is that they think it's not possible, but really it comes down to deep integration of technology. A traditional parking operator buys gate arms and machines and an app from third parties, and so they don't actually control their own technology stack. At Air Garage, we've built all of our own technology in-house, and we use it to do all of the operations. So there's that deep integration. And what we wind up doing is this real-time pricing experiment at all times on all of the drivers that are parking in our facilities. So we're basically tracking in real time. If we show driver A this price and driver B this price, how do they respond to those different prices? And that can help us find the optimal rate that it should be charged. Whereas most traditional parking companies, the way that they do pricing is not very data-driven. There's not a lot of technology in it. They're basically just sticking their finger in the wind once every couple of years, looking at what the pricing is around them and going with that. Uh, and so we really have brought a lot of data and experimentation to pricing for the first time. This is not being done by any other company in the parking industry uh, on 100% of the bookings that are coming through a facility. And so it can create meaningful uplifts. And so just to talk through kind of a case study here, we took over a parking lot in uh, South Carolina earlier this year, took it over about six months ago. And, you know, it's a surface lot, 150 spaces right next to like a very popular tourist area. And the parking lot traditionally just had gate arms, machines, attendants. Air Garage took it over. We have a gateless system, license plate reading cameras at the entrance, the exit, dynamic pricing and in, in, initiated and running, running experiments. And you can see on the right here with this graph, basically, as we continued to run experiments on the pricing over the first several weeks and months that we were operating this facility, uh, we were increasing the revenue that was generated from each driver and the overall revenue of the facility. And then you can see that we sort of reached a point of diminishing returns where you get to that 51% bar and you start to see that there's actually there's negative effects on the driver retention, the driver payment rate and stuff like that at that point. So you bring it back down. But it's like that pricing optimization found that there was a 44% increase in the revenue at this location, even though the traffic at the location was more or less the same as it was the year before. Uh, and so we're applying technology and data like this across our entire portfolio with great results because most parking companies just basically send you a spreadsheet at the end of the month that says like, hey, you made this much money, but they don't have this level of depth and data going into what they're doing. Um, and so just- Hey, quickly Jonathan, through, uh, yeah. if you don't mind, I, you, sure. I don't want to kill your flow here because it's super interesting. Okay. One would suggest that dynamic pr pricing would uh, require you to know what everybody else is charging in the neighborhood. Right. Is that something that you have data for? Yeah, that's exactly right. So it's it's a combination of a lot of things. So like our system is looking and our data team is looking basically at the area around and seeing what the rates are in the area. And then basically looking at the historical rates that have been in, in a parking lot. And we're looking at all of that data to inform sort of the base rates that we're charging and then also inform the different experimental groups. So when we say we saw this experimental uplift in the rates, what we mean is like we started with the same rates as the old operator had and some percentage of drivers that were pulling into the lot in a given week were being shown that rate and some drivers being shown like four different rates each. And so you can actually see the difference between the experimental group and the control group, which is how you're supposed to do, you know, a, a scientific study is like yeah, ABC in real time. testing. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's ABCD testing. We can test all sorts of different rates, but it's, it's informed by the local area because one of the biggest concerns that we hear from real estate owners, of course, right, is, is uh, basically, okay, if we just increase prices, we're going to scare people away. And that's where we sort of try to clarify things. It's like dynamic pricing is not just about let's jack up the rates, right? It's about how do you find the optimal rate to charge at different times of the day and different days of the week, right? Because the price that you're charging at 2 p.m. on Tuesday probably isn't the same price you should be charging at 6 p.m. on Friday, but in most parking garages, it is the same. And the price that you should be charging you know, in this lot and this lot should not be the same, but oftentimes right across the street from each other, they can be. And so it's, it's about pulling in a lot of data, including to your point, Arthur, data from the local area and trying to put all of that into the same system for the first time so that then you can get that feedback loop of like, okay, how do drivers respond to this? Because you don't want to see, hey, we increase the rates, but then people stop coming back. Like that would be a bad outcome. And so that's where you can see we sort of increased rates to a certain point and then uh, brought it back down to a point where it's like you don't see that negative impact as much. And so um, just to run through some of the other stuff that AirGarage does. Uh, I just want to briefly talk about like upgraded technology with Air Garage. There's no upfront cost of machines and gate arms and attendance and cash and all this sort of stuff. So we have an entirely pay via phone model where drivers pay through their phone. When they drive in, we have license plate reading cameras that sit at the entrance and the exit of the garage, track every vehicle that goes in and goes out uh, and gives us a lot of data about that. And so drivers, like I said, can be served different prices on their phone. 
Uh, and you know what we see is in a typical parking garage, you can spend upwards of one hundred to three hundred thousand dollars on parking gates uh, just for them to wind up breaking down. A lot of the owners that we work with, you know, they came back from using parking gates to working with their garage because they were like having problems with ticket machine jams, or you know, I think everybody's experienced the you're leaving a big event and you're in the parking garage and you have to wait thirty minutes to get out of the parking garage because there's a giant line. All of that is caused by these gate arms, which are kind of like a band aid solution that the parking industry is is relied on for far too long. Um, another thing is marketing and online booking. Uh, of course, if you have a real estate property of any sort, you want to make sure that as many people see it as possible so that you get as much and as many bookings. Air Garage has as, you know, booking integrations with every major aggregator of parking out there to drive additional demand to the parking lot. Uh, we also do business development on our front. So we basically will cold call all of the businesses that are near a facility that we take over in order to increase revenue and increase traffic and generate revenue because we operate basically on a revenue share with the owner. And so our incentive is how do we make you as much money as possible because that's how we make as much money as possible on our front as well. And the cool thing too is that um, you know we're not just coming in here and taking over and jacking up rates and making everything worse. We actually see that there's a meaningful increase in positive reviews and the overall average rating at locations that we take over. So these are just three examples one in South Carolina, one in California, one in Pennsylvania, of locations that we've taken over. And you can see that drivers have a very favorable opinion of air garage. And oftentimes what they're saying is, you know, I used to get stuck in this parking garage or I used to have to deal with machines and this attendant that was rude. Uh, and now air garage has made it really simple where I drive in, I drive out and I don't have to do much at all, which is great. Um, and then the thing that we're working toward in the long run, which uh, hopefully would be interesting and exciting to some of you all on the real estate side is just that you know, our, our fundamental product vision has always been that like the first step to replace these traditional companies is you have to replace them with this unified system of record, right? We think of it sort of as this like hot swap existence that we had to go through just to like get to parity with the old school companies that you might have worked with in the past on parking. Uh, it's sort of like in the Indiana Jones movie when he's uh, reaching onto the, the pedestal to replace the golden skull with a bag of sand and try to not set off the booby traps. It's like, we had to be able to do everything that the traditional companies could do, but do it with software. Because at the end of the day, uh, the real estate owner doesn't care that we use software. They just care that we're getting the job done. And so we just had to get the job done to start with. But now that we have that system of record, which we basically finished about a year, year and a half ago, what we've been doing is building on top of that with this data and hardware layer of license plate reading cameras and dynamic pricing and all of this stuff that's just feeding into that that unified system of record that is building on top of that platform in a way that traditional companies cannot do because they don't own their own tech stack, right? Uh, and what we're working toward in the future now, and we've done some really exciting experiments around this internally, is basically this future of automated asset management, right? Where, you know, if your revenue drops versus last year, we have all of the data in one system. And so we can go in and look at, hey, why did this happen? Was it because of like, you know, something that was broken in the system? Was it because of the weather? Was it because of, you know, extraneous events? Uh, but like basically just trying to bring artificial intelligence to this industry for the first time, which you can't meaningfully do if you don't have all of the data in one place. And so that is the future that we're working toward. And we think that that's how we will continue to increase revenue and net operating income for owners in the future. Uh, and so just really briefly, I'll talk about, um, you know, why Air Garage loves Mercury. Uh, we've been Mercury customers for a long time. Shelly might know off the top of her head. I, I don't know off the top of my head. It's probably been since like 2019 or 2020. Uh, so for quite a while. Um, and, you know, we we process a lot of payments every single day, right? Like we have hundreds of thousands of drivers that are parking in our facilities. Uh, we have a lot of financial activity that's happening in the background. And so it's really important to us to have basically the transparency and like the platform to be able to build on top of, to be able to facilitate all of that on behalf of our customers and also the drivers that we work with, right? And so really having great control and security over our finances from Mercury has been amazing. And plus we have Shelly on the team who's effectively like an extension of the Air Garage team and has done a great job of you know uh, helping us along the way, which is really amazing. Uh, it's great to have a partner that uh, can support us on all of these financial fronts. Uh, and then just final thoughts on kind of how we can work together. And thanks for listening. You know, we would love to talk to any of you if you own parking lots or parking garage or parking real estate. We'd love to speak with you about helping you manage those or at least doing an assessment of where we think there's room for opportunity for improvement in the future. Uh, we're also, you know, going to be raising a series B in the next six months or so. Uh, we're always looking for active investors, especially those that have experience in the real estate world, because, you know, we're backed by great VCs like Andreessen Horowitz, Founders Fund and Floodgate, but, uh, and they're, they're amazing, but they don't necessarily have a lot of real estate experience. And so one of the things we're prioritizing for series B is the sort of real estate angle. And I, I know that family offices are typically much more involved in that than a, than a VC would be. So we'll have to have conversations about that. And then also just if you're, you know, not currently an owner of parking assets, but you'd like to be, uh, Air Garage is sort of working on, you know, things with 
investors in order to enable them to participate in a fund uh, to purchase some parking real estate assets because we think that they're great long-term buy and hold properties and we have a unique lens on how to increase the revenue. So that's kind of how we'd love to work with all of you if you uh, are interested. Super clear. Thank you. You know, uh, the experience I have with parking garage is mostly New York City. And I think that might be idiosyncratic to New York City in that a lot of them were owned by people like they would sell the parking garage separate from the building and then the air rights. Right. Uh, so I was interested to see that you're going to perhaps invest in parking garage because that seems like the logical next step because you've got the secret weapon in your back pocket and you can go pay maybe a little bit more than somebody else um but is is new york city a, a beast on its own because of that sort of thing uh yeah good question new york city is definitely like a unique beast i mean what you see is that in sort of basically there's a few very dense downtowns like new york chicago san francisco some of la that are like unique kind of different from every other parking situation uh, New York specifically, it's like so much valet car stacking and stuff like that, that it's somewhere that we don't operate very heavily yet because we're very focused on self-parking, but it's it's definitely a unique market uh, in so many ways, right? Just like it is in commercial real estate in general. Yeah, there was just a couple big exits years ago, Kinney and a couple others and a couple families just owned parking garages everywhere. And it was so right. lucrative. I can remember going into the office of one of them and they had boxes and boxes and boxes of receipts you yes. know, through the old days. But uh, yeah, well, and that's, that's unfortunately, I mean, crazy enough, like how a lot of parking companies still run their business. And it's like, that's where there's a lot of opportunity for us and for investors that are interested in buying those assets is like, you know, if you can translate the operation from being in a bunch of shoe boxes to being in, you know, actual system of record and data and technology, like there's a lot of upside to be found in those. And that's where like the owners that we, work with have found a lot of success and are starting to deploy more capital is like, they're like, Hey, yeah, this is, you know, an edge that I now have and a tool that I now have that other owners aren't aware of. And so I can go buy your property based on this current revenue that you're making, which you're getting screwed by your operator and not optimizing this. And I'm going to partner with air garage and make a lot more upside on this. Yeah. Uh, we have a question about whether you're working with municipal governments, uh, M pay two or park mobile, that sort of thing. Yeah, it looks like there's um, there's two questions, one from Anthony about how we're different from MPay2 and Park yeah. Mobile, and then one from Rick about the government entities. So yeah, I mean, the way I would think about Park Mobile and um, the other platforms that are similar to it is they're basically just a technology company selling to a parking operator, uh, but it happens to be, generally speaking, a municipal, municipal operator. And the reason for that, right, is that a municipal government, usually they have enough scale that they want to do their own operations for their their parking uh, you know, system, so SFMTA and all of the other you know, government entities, they manage their own parking, but they're never going to build their own app. And so then there's been kind of this cottage industry of you know, apps that are just getting sold to those government entities because they don't have a way for to develop internally and it wouldn't make sense for them to develop internally uh, you know, the application for people to be able to pay. Uh, and you know, we do work with a couple small municipalities, nothing major right now. We usually have avoided it because like we're not really like, you know, at a stage where we have the the bandwidth and like resources to go through, a, you know, an RFP process. Uh, and so when municipalities have come to us and basically said, we want to work with Air Garage, what we usually tell them is, you know, we'll work with you as long as you handhold our, you know, our hand through this entire process and yeah. kind of like shepherd us through it. We're happy to help you, you know, as much as we can, since it sounds like you're, you're kind of desperate for a solution, but we don't go actively search for those or anything like that. Um, and so, yeah, it's just been interesting trying to find the balance there, but in the future, we'll definitely work with the municipalities a lot more than we do today. But for right now, for the sake of growth and speed, we've been focused on private real estate owners who obviously move a lot faster than municipalities. Yeah. If you're winning business, otherwise you have to, you only have so much bandwidth and resources, right? Yeah. All right. So the, uh, thank you for that. We've got an opportunity for business development and the next round so it's super interesting to be aware of that. Millie, same with you. We've got the next fund where there's potential opportunity for people to participate. My question for you, Millie, is have you met Lex Friedman? Sorry, yes. That's okay. Since you're in Boston, have you met Lex mm -hmm. Friedman? Uh, yeah, he's a friend of a friend. Um, so uh, I don't know him super well, but uh, we are in the same friend circle. And yeah. we go to the same nerdy parties. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just a big fan. So that was my little editorial. Yeah. So, um, and Suman, the 
performance of the prior fund is you know speaks for itself and um perhaps we can look forward to some of the folks participating in your next fund and uh like i said uh, with everybody here we'll make sure that uh people get in touch we'll also make uh, make sure that all the questions that were posted whether we answered them or not you guys can have directly and reply to them directly um i think we have a duplicate question yeah government entities yeah with with that so um thank you for doing this it's super helpful uh you, you guys were amazing i actually like the idea of doing these in 15 minute increments just because uh i'm usually pulled in to ask the questions over an hour and it's exhausting but i'm i'm, I'm okay with it um so Shelly can we and Puya, can we talk a little bit about uh the the profile of the Mercury customer that is interesting to you? Yes. Um so uh, you can hear me, right? I'm off. I'm yes. off mute. Okay, great. Uh so Mercury uh in general uh services business banking. Uh so we have over a hundred thousand. Uh, companies on our platform, many of them are smaller, they're in e-commerce, but the majority of our revenue and business comes with our focus on uh, high growth startups. And so we've built out our offering to really support the startup uh, growth process and by extension, uh, the VCs and investors who are part of that ecosystem. Uh, so for Puya and I, uh, we're working on the strategic a relationship management team, which is the more white glove uh, interaction that we really cultivate and nurture our high growth clients, uh, both on the founder side, uh, like Air Garage, and also with our growing VC and emerging fund manager and now family office clients uh, on the uh, funder side. Um, so some things that we have uh, built out that make this a lot easier is we enable it, we enable, make it very easy for you to manage multiple orgs at once to open multiple entities. Uh, we're building out a single dashboard view that will enable you to manage the accounts of all of the entities that you are a part of. Uh, founders get access to uh, programs like these, uh, connections to investors, activations within the ecosystem, as well as uh, really pushing product to continue innovating uh, and evolving to meet the needs of companies as they scale. So for us, we are very excited always to accept introductions for um, uh, portfolio companies uh, within an investment portfolio, and we're happy to connect with them at any stage. If they're pre-seed, if they're seed, we have a mid-market team that cultivates uh, the relationship with companies from the $500,000 to $5 million to $8 million uh, deposit size. Uh, so we're really happy to get to companies early and help them grow. And if you are in contact with more mature companies, uh, we're always happy to connect with them. That would be directly myself and Puya, uh, who could take that introduction. Uh, we provide venture debt. Uh, I know that's a dirty word for some people, but I promise you will change your mind. Air Garage is a, a client and they're interested in uh, working with us again. Um, and yeah, just in general, uh, I, I think the benefit of what we have here is we have a lot of flexibility and a lot of motivation uh, to keep innovating, to meet the evolving needs of this ecosystem and with the technology that's needed. Uh, so any feedback or questions, intros, whatnot, uh, please reach out to myself or Puya and we'd be happy to chat. And Puya, how's, how's the uh, sentiment so far in uh, uh, going after emerging managers? Yeah, it's uh, uh, so far it's been very receptive. Uh, you know, the SVB, FRB incident really opened the door for Mercury to become a player in the space. Typically, a lot of the emerging managers are working with those two firms and we're now looking for alternatives and they're finding, giving us a shot. Uh, that our offering is 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 pretty compelling, not only in, on the tax uh, on the tech side of things, but again the value added side of things, such as our Mercury Raise program, where we get founders or investors in front of founders, or like these family offices some seminars and uh, uh, other other areas that we 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 present to them. So it's been a uh, it's it's been really worthwhile. That I would say in the past uh, three months, we've had about at least five hundred VC firms, emerging manager firms, sign up. So it's it's catching on pretty quickly. Nice, yeah. And there's a total of a hundred thousand clients now, right? About that in total for for yeah, Mercury. Probably a little more now. Yeah. 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 Super cool. Well, 
listen, uh, you all have been very, very effective in communicating your story. And I've seen a million of these. So thank you for doing that for us. I know the community appreciates it. And uh, again, we'll, uh, uh, we'll be doing another session on the 6th. I think we'll have everybody. Is everybody going to join, Shelly? Yeah. Today? Yeah. Great. Uh, yeah. And so get an opportunity to to invite some others. And of course, you're most welcome to invite anybody that you'd like. Each of the companies and the funds as well, they're most welcome to have people to join in. Absolutely. I put up here the uh, contact info for everyone on this call, uh, including myself and Puya. Uh, Arthur will also send this out to everyone who registered and the broader network uh, of Family Office Insights. Uh, definitely recommend uh, at least registering for the November 6th uh, because we will have some deeper dives into uh, the business case. Some LPs are going to be joining us to speak from their perspective on why uh, they have invested uh, in the fund uh, or in the company. Uh, and overall, uh, we're super excited to uh, see you all again in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Thank you again, everybody, for for carving out some time to do this with us today. And Shelly and Puya, super excited about continuing to do this and, and having some impact for everybody and connecting people with investors and business development and banking. Um, super, super interesting, and I appreciate it. And uh, as I always say when I conclude these, thank you for sharing with us the only thing you can't make more, uh, more of, and that's your time. So till next time. Thank you, Shelly Poole. Thank you so Thank much. You, okay. Bye-bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you.